بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين Welcome to my latest video I'm going to look at um, a rather strange report in this video that has been circulating on the web um, and that is the claim and it is a bizarre one that the Queen of England is a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it would appear that this claim, this khabar, this report, has been in circulation on the web for some time. Indeed, I first came across it some five or six years ago when I was living in Egypt when uh, the Mufti of Egypt, oh, excuse me, by that time I think he had already become the former Mufti of Egypt, namely Ali Guma'a made such a claim on some sort of an Egyptian TV program. I didn't see that whole program. I just saw a clip. And the odd thing is that Ali Guma claims that this is documented and that, that it is attested in books in both the Arabic and in the English languages. But of course, he does not mention any sources. So at the time, I looked into the matter and didn't really think much about it after that. It would appear that this claim has now resurfaced shortly after the demise of the husband of the Queen of England, Prince Philip, a uh, report surfaced, um, or excuse me, a video surfaced, or a video appeared, um, or which I think had been, um, yeah, uploaded some six months before, actually, but I came across it sometime after uh, the death of Philip. Now, I don't know why it appeared on my YouTube feed. I was certain, had certainly no interest whatsoever in the demise of uh, Philip. And I hadn't searched it anywhere. Um, but it came up in, uh, under a lecture of Hamza Yusuf. And so that may be the ex explanation. But the fact is, I don't really know when he said this, but the video was uploaded about six months ago. And the video is entitled, Are You From the Lineage of the Prophet? So I just want to play the video so that we can see exactly what he says, just the first minute or so. The family of the Prophet is obviously the al Bayt is the, the uncles, of the Prophet Hamza radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Hamza. The weird thing about Hamza Yusuf, I'm just going to stop that there, is that he, like many Sunni ulama, for some reason, think that they should not properly show respect to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and recite the formula which I just did correctly in its full form. As you heard, he does something like, and the Sunnis have this weird habit of coming up with and slurring the actual formula of respect and benediction and invocation of blessings on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet and it's highly ironic, it's highly, you know, that it comes up in this video in which he's talking all about showing respect to the Prophet At any rate, let us continue. is obviously the al Bayt is the, the uncles of the Prophet Hamza radiallahu anhu, Hamza. We go visit him, honor him, the Shuhada of Uhud. And Al-Abbas, Aqil, who's Sheikh Abdullah Al-Qadi's grandfather. All these people, we honor them and love them. And then their children, and then the children, Ja'far, the cousins, and their children, Al Jafar. You know, last night I was with five or six of them. You know, just from Al Ahsad, they're from Al Jafar, and you should love them because they're the children of the Prophet's family. And and anybody who has intisab, many people have intisab. Some people look at it like, how's that possible? Well, it's very easy. The majority of people on the earth, according to Khalid Bangshi, probably have some blood from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even the non-Muslims, Queen Elizabeth claims it in her lineage. John Kerry, if if you look at peerage, Bird's peerage, John Kerry has uh, the man that ran for president. He has blood from the family of the Prophet ﷺ through a Persian connection. So a lot of people have blood. And again, he slurred the formula of benediction and respect to the Prophet 
صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. And um, I don't really know when he made this statement. He mentioned some person. I don't know which this person is, one of his teachers maybe, and that he had recently met with some people, etc., etc. It doesn't concern me. Um, but he says that the queen claims some uh, lineal or blood tie, lineal descent or blood tie to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And then he makes the bizarre, even more bizarre claim <laughs> about John Kerry. And he doesn't cite any source, but in the case of John Kerry, he says Burke's peerage. Now, if you know a little bit about um, these royal houses of Europe, there is a kind of uh, registry, I think maybe that would be the right word, but a kind of documentation, which is known as Burke's Peerage. This is an actual published work. Uh, I don't know that it still comes out. Maybe it's only online, but they do have a website and you can check. And if you investigate this a bit further, as I did, you will find out that someone from that same uh organization or registry or publishing house or all of those, namely Burke's Peerage, made some sort of a statement <clears throat> which first appeared um, in 1986 um, through, and this was before the internet, so that was a, a UPI press release. UPI is United Press International. You can do a search uh, through the United Press International Archives, the UPI archive, which you, I, you, you can do online, and then you will find that this this was this this um, claim for a surfaced around 1986 through someone at Burke's Peerage. Uh, let's just take an, a, a, an aside here with regard to John Kerry. I'm not interested really in talking about the connection with, with John Kerry, but since it did come up in the video, he says there's a Persian connection there. So similarly, if you do some kind of a search under John Kerry, a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Burke's peerage, you will get search results that again the same organization Burke's peerage claims that John Kerry has some sort of a lineal descent from the Safavid Shahs of Iran. Well, whether that is a fact or not, I don't know. I cannot look into that. But uh, let's assume that there is, uh, even if there is. Um, the Safavid rulers of Iran have, to my knowledge, no connection that would make them Sayyids, uh, that would make them Sada or Ashraf. So I really don't know what was going on on there. Um, in the to return then to the Queen of England, it's strange that Hamza Yusuf should make this kind of a remark, given the fact that he is um, a recognized. Sunni scholar and leader. Uh, now, perhaps he was speaking in an informal context. I don't know that he has himself endorsed the release of this video. If you look at the video, it's it's really, really actually an audio with a bunch of images. It's not him speaking anywhere. It's a bunch of images, shots of Mecca and the Kaaba and things like this. Um, so maybe he was speaking in an informal context. But even so, if you put yourself forward as some sort of a leader of the Muslims of, of, of the United States, uh, a leading fig a leader of of, uh, of the Muslim community in the United States, and you, and you make a statement like that, you know, you should maybe look into it, and uh, it's not that hard to check. So if you actually look into the claim made by Burke's peerage, they go through tens and tens of generations until they come back in the in the genealogy of Queen Elizabeth to an, an ancestor of hers who was supposed to have by, via uh, marriage. Uh, married into uh, one of the noble families, uh, some of the noble families, excuse me, of Spain and Portugal. And the connection is supposed to come through there from Muslim Spain or and uh, Al Andalus or Andalusia. And it goes all the way back, it is claimed, to the last ruler of Seville in a period in Islamic history in Spain, in Al Andalus, known as the Muluk al Tawa'if. Or, you know, the petty kings of the principalities, they were all fighting each other. And this is also known as the Reyes des Ta'ifas. Now, if you want to know exactly what's going on, you can refer to The New Islamic Dynasties by Clifford Edmund Bosworth, a standard work of reference in Islamic studies. And then you can determine, you know, the death date, for example, of this last ruler of uh, Ishbiliya or Seville, who is known as Al-Mu'atamid ibn Abbad. 
And this is very easy to use. You come here, you find the Maluka Tawaif or Reyes de, de Taifas in Spain. Sorry, it's Reyes de Taifas. I think I said des Taifas. Spanish is not a language which I know. And you find the Abadids of Seville. So you go to page 14. And sure enough, we have the reigns of these monarchs. So you find the Abadids of Seville, and there were only three um, until about f until 484 when we had the conquest uh, of Spain or Al-Andalus by uh, the Murabitun or the Al-Murabids. And so we have Muhammad II, Ibn Abad, who had the patronymic or Kunya of Abu al-Qasim and the royal title of Al-Mu'tamid. And he died in the year 487. He ruled from 461 to 484. These are all Hijra dates. Uh, in the Gregorian calendar, he died in 1095, and his years of reign, or the, his reign extended from 1069 to 1091 of the Gregorian calendar. So the claim is made that she is a descendant of Al-Mu'tamid ibn Abbad. This is his the way he is known as simply Al-Mu'tamid ibn Abbad. Well, how is that supposed to be? Apparently, it is well. It is claimed that he had a daughter, and that this daughter, after the you know the the fall of 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 Seville, um, um, was taken captive, and taken as a wife by uh, these uh, uh, conquerors, and so the line uh, presumably goes from there. Well, in the Muslim sources, and again, this is not something hard to check you will find that it's not at all clear that Al-Mu'tamid even ever had a daughter. It may, in fact, be, if there is any connection at all, through his daughter-in-law. Whatever the case may be, whether daughter or daughter-in-law, and if it's daughter-in-law, it's even more problematic, but let's say it's just the daughter, which is what, in, in fact, the Burke's peerage people are claiming. It all comes down to whether Al-Mu'tamid ibn Abbad himself is a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam or not. So, you know, it's not hard to do research in Islamic studies for someone who lived that late. You know, there's even biographies of early compa of, of companions, sahaba, of, there's, there's biographical information on pre-Islamic. There's a lot of information that is easily available to a person trained in Islamic studies. So all you have to do is go to, for example, a very important biographical dictionary called Wafayatul A'yan. And I don't actually own this. This is, again, a, a the relevant pages I printed out from a PDF I downloaded on the web. Wafayatul A'yan wa anba'u abna'i zaman li Abul Abbas Shamsuddin Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr ibn Khallikan. So he's simply known as Ibn Khallikan for short. He lived from 608 to 681. This is the critical edition by Dr. Ihsan Abbas, a very famous editor of Muslim te of Arabic texts, of Arabic historical texts. And this is the Dar Sadr edition from Beirut, volume 5, page 21, entry number 686. Frankly, if you know about Islamic history, as soon as someone tells you, oh, they're the ruler of Seville, you know that he is not from Banu Hashim. But here's, I'm just citing the source. So for, for, for the genealogical connection, for the blood tie, for the lineal descent that is claimed for the queen to be true, Al-Mu'tamid ibn Abbad would have to have been a Sayyid. That's the most important thing. And then obviously you have to actually establish that she is a descendant. And in the Arabic historical sources, there is no daughter, which is claimed. So it falls apart on two counts. So let's just look at his uh, full name and his ancestry. And that's in the first paragraph on page 21. And that's more than enough. This is actually something like a 25-page entry on him because he was a very great poet and man of letters. And so they, there's all these accounts of his poetry and things like this in here. Well, let's just read what it says here in the Arabic. And this is just a bunch of names and titles. So I'm just going to read it to the end until the relevant ants, until we reach his earliest and most illustrious um, ancestor in this genealogy given here. So he is Al-Mu'tamid, Alallahi, that's his title. Abu Al-Qasim, that's his patronymic. Muhammad, that's his name. Ibn Al-Mu'tadid Billah, Abi Amr Abbad. So that's the title of his father and his patronymic, who is Amr, sorry, who is Abbad. 
ابن الظافر المؤيد بالله أبي القاسم محمد قاضي إشبيلية ابن أبي الوليد إسماعيل So it goes back to the Qadi, his grandfather, who was the first to become the first ruler of, of Seville. There's a whole story behind that, which isn't relevant for our purposes. And the genealogy continues therefrom. So it's Ismail ibn Quraysh. This is not the Quraysh of the Prophet. This is a name. It's much, 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 much later. Quraysh ibn Abbad ibn Amr ibn Aslam ibn Amr ibn, I think, Ataf or Ataf ibn Naim or Noim. Al-Lakhmi. Aha, so that he's from the Banu Lakhm. He's not from the Banu Hashim. Min, and 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 th- these people were from Min Walad in Nu'man. Min Walad in Nu'man ibn al-Mundhir al-Lakhmi. So they are descendants of, they are the offspring of someone, very famous figure in pre-Islamic history, known as, as Al-Nu'man ibn al-Mundhir al-Lakhmi who was the last of the kings of Al-Hira. They were Christian Arabs in pre-Islamic times. And this um, Banu Lakhm is also related to Banu Tanukh. And anyhow, in the final final conclusion is that this has nothing, there is no connection with the Banu Hashim. So he cannot be a Sayyid or a, uh, a Sharif or a Mulay, uh, you know, to use the various titles which are current in the Muslim world. This is not hard to check. Um, and mind you, this is an area in Ilmul Ansab, I would say probably the least um, uh, exciting, personally for me, area of Islamic studies, but nevertheless, it is there. And these things are not hard to check. If you are interested in Ilmul Ansab, just by way of information, I think one of the best books on the subject is Ilmul Nasab Lughatuhu Mus. Talahuhu Rumuzuhu in three volumes by Muhammad Rida al Mamakani. This is a really good book. Not easy to find, but it's a very important book. Um, I'm sure you can find it in Iran or in Iraq. I think you'll be hard pressed to locate a copy for purchase in the United States. More than likely, there's a copy in the Princeton University Library. Haven't checked, but it's a good library. So. In short, there is no basis whatsoever for the claim. Yet Hamza Yusuf makes the claim uh, rather, I think, irresponsibly, as did Ali Guma, but Ali Guma is known for his acts of irresponsibility. Uh, <laughs> Ali Guma, if you don't know, after the current uh, so-called president of Egypt came to power, um, in fact, he appeared before him and claimed that he had seen the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in a dream and that the Prophet had said that, yes, they should go ahead and shoot all those people, which they did in Rabaa Square. And I'm in no way endorsing any of those uh, political movements in Egypt, but I'm simply denouncing Ali Goma and pointing out his, uh, his less than uh, sterling record. In this regard, he has something in common with Hamza Yusuf, I think. Because if you look at uh, look at that video or listen to the rest of what is being said by Hamza Yusuf in that, he's talking about how important it is to respect the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his descendants. And in this regard, he quotes from an important book called the Qawaid al-Tasawwuf by Abu al-Abbas Ahmad ibn Muhammad al-Zarruq. This is not a very good, you know, this is not a critical edition. But it's the principles or qawaid of Sufism by the famous um, Shadali Shaykh Ahmad uh, Az-Zarruq. And there is a very important statement in there. In this edition, in this edition, it's on page, hold on a second, on 30, I think. So this is a, just a, you know, a trade edition pub- published by Maktabat al-Kulliyat al-Azhariya. There's no date. And it's actually Qaida number 52, or principle number 52, which in this edition is on, extends over pages 30 to 32, in which he talks about the importance of respecting the Prophet ﷺ and his descendants. And in this regard, he quotes Muhyiddin ibn al Arabi. Interestingly enough, there is a translation of Qawaida Tasawuf. It's called The Principles of Sufism, an annotated translation with introduction by Zainab Istarabadi. 
This is a pretty old work. It was never published. It was her PhD dissertation, uh, April 1988, Indiana University, um, advised by Victor Danner. By way of footnote, if you, it's interesting to know that Zainab Astrabadi was actually the secretary for many years for Edward Said. Yeah, so there's a whole translation here by Zainab Astrabadi. It's not very good, uh, in my opinion, at least in the passage in, in, in question. And there is actually a critical edition of the Qawaid al-Tasawwuf, uh, which was also a PhD thesis much later. It's September 2009, and this is a University of Exeter that's in the UK by Ghulam Shamsur Rahman, a critical edition of Qawaid al-Tasawwuf by Ahmad Zarruq. I forgot to say, Ahmad Zarruq died in 899 of the Hijra. That's 1493, so it's pretty late. But the passage in question is about showing respect to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and that's nothing which we would dispute. And then he quotes uh, Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi. Um, the Shams al-Rahman edition is very, very small. I can't even see it with glasses. It's absolutely tiny. Look at that. Absolutely tiny. Um, so we'll just go here. It's no, no real difference. So Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi he begins by saying, He's trying to say that the um, divine attributes do not change. And in this regard, he's really referring to a verse in the Quran, which is something which, oddly enough, the Shia always quote uh, to establish the infallibility or the isma, the, being, the guardedness or protection from the committing of mistakes and sins on the part of the um, of the imams. But the odd thing is that uh, Ibn al-Arabi and Ahmad Zarruq with, with, um, approvingly quotes this to apply to all of the descendants of the Prophet, which is kind of funny in the sense that if you listen to what Hamza Yusuf says further in the video, he talks about, oh, you know, the status of the descendants of the Prophet is really important. And you know, even if they do bad things, we should, you know, forgive them and make dua for them and so on and so forth <clears throat> and uh, respect them. And, you know, but the Shia, you know, they, they do ghulu, they go too far and say that they're infallible. There's also ghulu in it. Uh, some of the Shia tradition go to an extreme and say that the a'imma are infallible. We don't believe that. They're human beings, they make mistakes. And so some of the Sa'da have abused that, but even Sidi Ahmed Zarruq said, even if they abuse it, or, or they're sinners, or they're distant from Allah, you should always have compassion and mercy for them, and look at them as your best friend and most beloved's child, that you just feel bad for them. Well, in this quote by Muhyiddin ibn al-Arabi, <laughs> and what Hamza Yusuf is endorsing, uh, you know, and what is being upheld by Ahmad Zarruq is that all of the descendants of the Prophet وسلم, even if they commit mistakes, are going to be forgiven for their sins. So it's like they've got a free pass. <laughs> and this is an interesting thing that is there in this book, Qawaid al-Tasawwuf, upheld by Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. And when I lived in Egypt, I found that this was widespread in Egypt. In fact, in fact... In fact, there is a, a, a Shadari Sufi Tariqa uh, in Egypt, which uh, is centered in uh, a small town called Shablanga, and was founded by a guy named Abdul Fatah Al Qadi. And he was just sort of a village Quran teacher, but he had this profound spiritual experience. He gained quite a following. Uh, people like Abdul Jalil Qasim of Al Azhar, his brother. Uh, Sheikh Gouda, uh, prominent figures like Hassan Abbas Zeki. And there's actually, Hassan Abbas Zeki, if you don't know, was a one time Minister of Finance in the um, Gamal Abdel Nasser government. And there's a biography of Abdel Fattah al Qadi called Al Manar al Hadi. And this is by Abdel Jalil Qasim. And uh, there's an introduction by Sheikh Abdel Halim Mahmoud, who was the Sheikh of Azhar at the time, and Dr. Hassan Abbas Zeki. And in this also, if you look up in the con in the table of contents about what the aqidah of these people is about the Ahl Bayt, you'll find he's upholding the exact same thing as Ahmad Zarruq. Namely, that all of the descendants of the Prophet وسلم, <clears throat> no matter what they do, their sins are forgiven. So presumably they will receive whatever punishment they are to receive in this world, but not in the next world. And furthermore, the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, is quoted by Ahmad Zarruq 
saying that um, Fatima is a part of me. Yeah, Fatima to bid'atu minni, and um, you know Fatima is a part of me, and 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 whatever uh, harms her or whatever <clears throat> makes her unhappy is you know is the same for me. Uh, there's different versions of it, and he, you know he also quotes the thing from the Quran about how I I ask no recompense from you you know for conveying the message except that you love my family. So all of these things are sort of quoted. Abdul Fattah al qadi does the same, and Hamza Yusuf is doing the same. And so that makes what he says about the queen even more uh, problematic. Is he implying then that we should respect this monarch? You know, the, the, the British sovereign, you know, this whole royal house, this whole British empire, which was responsible for so much death and destruction and, and, and thievery, <laughs> and colonization uh, throughout throughout the whole world and and the Muslim world in, in particular in the context that we're talking. I mean, is, is he does he imply that should he respect John Kerry? Um, to be fair, he doesn't directly say that, but there is such an implication, and that too is not really surprising. Uh, you know, Hamza Yusuf has a history of um, taking various uh, pious stances, but it seems that he does not have the strength of his convictions. Because when it comes to um, Persian Gulf potentates, um, he's quite happy to do their bidding and to take their money for his college. And the same goes for his, his master, uh, Abdullah ibn Bayya. Abdullah ibn Bayya, in fact, is quite funny. He has, um, this was a couple of months after the brutal murder of that journalist. There is an article. Where did it go? It's absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, this is dated 12-12-2018. So December 12th, 2018. When was the Khashoggi killing? It was in October of 2018. Second of October, I've, I have a note here. Yes, second of October 2018. And the Binbaya statement is a couple of, uh, you know, seven months approximately later in December, in which he claims that um, the efforts of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in combating extremism and promoting moderation and, um, and um, it says i'tidal, you could translate that as moderation again. Um, balance, I suppose. تُعَدُّ مِثَالًا يُحْتَذَى بِهِ فِي الْعَالَمِ الْإِسْلَامِ Should be considered an example that should be emulated throughout the Islamic world. So this is Hamza Yusuf and his teachers servants of tyrants and oppressors and he makes these bizarre claims in this video that's just inexcusable uh, especially since you know he's supposed to be an islamic scholar he never ceases in, in 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 invoking and sort of flexing if i may put it that way his knowledge of arabic in his talks and his lectures and many people admire him because he's this you know guy who converted to Islam and so on and so forth. And yet, he couldn't simply go and look this up in Wafayat al-A'yan and goes around making these idiotic remarks about how the queen is a descendant of the Prophet Wasallam. I think this is quite inexcusable. I think it's high time that Muslims, you know, cut Hamza Yusuf down several notches and you know called and called uh, called him on some of these positions that he's taken